Hi everyone and a very warm welcome to you all again from Scotland. I'm Gordon Young from Gordon Scotland showing videos for people who love Scotland and everything Scottish. So this is the second video in my series So You Think You Know Scotland aimed at helping you understand the real Scotland just that little bit better. So this one is all about an area of Scotland called the Scottish Borders a region that is close to June and I's heart because we lived there for quite a number of years and still have many friends there. Now, if I had to sum up this lovely area of Scotland in one phrase, I would say community spirit. When you hear people complaining nowadays that folk don't respect the towns they live in, don't care about their traditions or cultures, don't even know the people in the town, then you're not talking about the Scottish borders. In the Scottish borders, they have a burning love of their towns and villages. They care so much about their traditions and cultures. They know everything that goes on in their town and they will know everybody who lives there. Okay, let's get started with some of the basics. Where in Scotland is the Scottish borders region located? It lies to the south and the east of Edinburgh. Its northern boundaries butt onto the Lothians, the counties that encircle Edinburgh, whilst its southern edge stretches, stretches along almost the entire border with England. On the east it runs along the coast of the North Sea, whilst its western edge stretches way out into the southern uplands. The Scottish Borders has a population of 115,000 people, which is about 2% of the total of Scotland. In terms of area, however, it is about 1,800 square miles, which I think is about 6%. So, it's a pretty large rural area and it's not heavily populated. The largest towns in the Scottish Borders are Galashiels and Hoyk. Counties or administrative areas in Scotland used to be called shires and the Scottish Borders now is made up of the old historic shires of Berwickshire, Peeblesshire, Roxburghshire and Selkirkshire. A wee historical footnote here. The word shire is derived from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning administrative area and in the Anglo-Saxon period shires were governed by a royal official known as a shire reef and this subsequently evolved into sheriff. So that's where all the famous sheriffs got their title from. The entire Scottish Borders is a very scenic area with rolling hills, sparkling rivers and streams, fine farming land and lovely coasts. Through almost its entire length runs the River Tweed, a river famous the world over for its salmon fishing and beauty. It rises in the far west of the area and runs for 95 miles eastward until it enters the North Sea at the town of Berwick-upon-Tweed. Another historical footnote, the word Tweed, as in the name of the well-known woolen cloth, derives its name from this river and the area's rich textile heritage. But more about that later. Now I want to take you back almost 2,000 years to what life was like in the Scottish borders then. In 43 AD, the Romans had invaded this, this country they called Britannia, which is today's Britain, and 30 years later had conquered most of England and Wales. They then turned their attention to that wild region that lay to the north that they called Caledonia. Campaigns by Julius Agricola succeeded in the Romans capturing most of southern and eastern Scotland and in 80 AD Agricola established his forward post in the Scottish borders and he called it Trimontium. Trimontium got its name from the Latin words trium meaning three and montium meaning mountains and it was called this because it lay in the lee of the lovely Eildon Hills which have three peaks near the present town of Melrose. From this mighty fort roads ran south to York and north to the Antonine Wall that stretched between present day Edinburgh and Glasgow. Some roads in use today in the Scottish borders still follow the same route and are easily identified as they are so straight. Historical footnote. Why did the Romans always build their roads straight? It's because Roman power was based on their mighty legions, their armies, and the legions marched everywhere. So if you want your army to get somewhere as fast as possible, it's best to make the roads as short as possible. 
Now, step up the mathematicians amongst you. What is the shortest distance between two points? As Greek mathematician Archimedes discovered, a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Hence, Roman roads were always straight. Nothing is left now of this mighty Roman fort, which once housed up to 1,500 Roman legionnaires. But a memorial marks its location, and there is a local museum that is open in the summer. I love standing here thinking about those legionnaires who marched all the way to the far edge of the then known world. What did they think of Caledonia? Let's fast forward now 600 years. The Romans have gone, but one of the benefits their rule gave Caledonia was the amalgamation of the many different warring tribes who had previously inhabited it. In the north, the Picts had largely taken over, whilst a large part of the south now became part of the mighty kingdom of Northumbria. This kingdom stretched all the way from the Midlands of England all the way up to Edinburgh and the Firth of Forth. One of the great achievements of Northumbria was the introduction of Christianity, mostly from the holy island of Lindisfarne, and this drove a golden age of culture and art. Renowned works of art such as the Lindisfarne Gospels and the works of the Venerable Bede date from this glorious period. The Kingdom of Northumbria lasted for about 300 years and then parts of it, especially in the southern section, succumbed to invasions by Vikings. This allowed the development of the country of Scotland we know today and by 1124 AD King David I ruled a country called Scotland which included all of the Scottish borders down to the River Tweed. Another wee historical footnote, King David built a chapel in Edinburgh Castle in honour of his mother, Queen Margaret, a very pious woman who later became a saint. St Margaret's Chapel is the oldest building in Edinburgh and many of you who have visited the castle will no doubt have seen it. King David was also responsible for building what are often seen as the most magnificent historical buildings in the Scottish borders, the Border Abbeys. There are four of these abbeys, Melrose, Jedburgh, Dryborough and Kelso. The abbeys all suffered badly during the medieval wars with England and all are now ruined. Kelso was the biggest and most powerful, but all were very important institutions. Melrose Abbey is probably the best known abbey today, but all are very worth visiting. Historical footnote. King Robert the Bruce of Scotland died without achieving his greatest wish to go on a crusade, so his trusted lieutenant, Sir James Douglas, took King Robert's embalmed heart in a casket and went on a crusade. Sir James was killed along with most of his fellow Scottish knights, but his body was returned to Scotland and King Robert's heart was buried at Melrose Abbey as the king had requested. You can still see the site today. In 1502, Scotland and England signed a treaty. It was called the Treaty of Perpetual Peace and it was aimed at bringing an end to hostilities between the two nations. As part of this treaty, King James IV of Scotland married Margaret Tudor, the daughter of King Henry VII of England. However, this peace was rudely shattered in 1513, just over 10 years later, when King James decided to invade England at the bequest of the French. The French were, as usual, at odds with England and had requested the Scottish help. Now, many of James's nobles advised him against this, with the Earl of Angus saying, Scotland has already done too much for the French. But James was determined. He raised the largest Scotti Scottish army ever raised, and he marched into England, where he was met just over the border at a place called Flodden. What followed was Scotland's greatest ever defeat. Its army was decimated by an English army much smaller than it. Its king and most of its nobles lay dead on the battlefield at the end of the day. It was said that on that day there wasn't a single noble house in Scotland who did not lose at least one son. On a historical footnote, James IV was the last ever monarch to die on a battlefield in Britain. 
What followed this dreadful defeat was a period of intermittent war with England that stretched for about 90 years. And in this, the Scottish borders suffered more than most other areas of Scotland, with English and Scottish armies crisscrossing the border and constant battles and skirmishes. However, there was another unique aspect to warfare in the Scottish borders, and this was caused by groups of armed mounted men called the Border Reavers. The word reeve means to plunder, and these men were both Scottish and English who raided both sides of the border at will and without a care. The number of armed men involved in a raid could range from a few dozen up to organised campaigns involving 3,000 riders. The raiders would steal livestock, household goods, valuables and take prisoners for ransom. The border areas on both sides of the border, called marches, were pretty lawless and the officials in charge of upholding the law, the march wardens, were often involved in, in the reaving themselves. Following the union of the crowns under King James VI and the subsequent union between Scotland and England, there was at last peace between the two countries. The border reavers were outlawed and an era of prosperity and transformation began in the Scottish borders. The Industrial Revolution began and the Scottish borders became a world leader in the production of textiles. The hardy cheviot sheep provided top quality wool. There was an abundance of clean water in fast flowing rivers and a hard working talented workforce. As I mentioned, when you hear the word tweed referring to the famous woolen cloth, then this is where it originated. The towns of Galashiels and Selkirk were at the forefront of tweed weaving. As well as the weaving of cloth, the Scottish borders also became world renowned for the design and production of top class knitwear, especially cashmere. The town of Hoyk was renowned for this, and if you have ever owned a piece of top class designer cashmere knitwear, then there's a good chance it was made in Hoyk. Whilst the industry has declined in recent years, there are still some mills operating and the School of Textiles and Design in Galashiels helps train youngsters in important traditional skills. And you can still visit some mills and get bargains. I'm going to end this piece on the Scottish borders where I started, talking about community spirit. The Scottish borders is a region of Scotland with a ferocious love and respect for its own traditions and culture, and nothing sums this up more than the series of summer festivals held every year in many borders towns which are called common ridings. These festivals usually revolve around mounted riders riding around the marches or the borders of their town and celebrate the town's history and culture. They date back to the 13th century and form a very important part of the social life of the towns. A major part of the celebration is the election of the man and woman who will lead the celebrations on behalf of the entire town. They are given different titles in each town, such as Cornet and his lass, Bra Lad and Bra Lass, Callant and Honest Lad and Lass. Being elected to these posts, which they hold for a year, is seen as a major honour for the participants, representing, as they do, the honour of their town. So, hopefully this video has given you a better understanding of the Scottish borders. This is a highly attractive part of Scotland, with lovely gentle scenery, fine rivers, rolling hills, great walks, wonderful traditions and history, and many, many fine villages and towns. It's a great place to visit and it's very easy to get to. As usual, if you have any comments or questions, please just leave them below and I'll get back to you on it. If you've enjoyed this video, I would love that if you could subscribe and perhaps also tell your friends about it. So anyway, for now, I'll just wish you all a very fond farewell from Scotland.